This is nobody from Family Limits GB. Look at this, but I stole this. Um, oh no, everything's falling through. Uh, I stole this from our dorm in Tokyo, um, from our flat door. So um, sorry, Family Limits GB, for that. I have committed a crime. Um, please don't come for me. So when we first started talking, I said to Lauren that I always wanted to get a cat. I used to have cats and I um, have always said I wanted to get another cat when I you know, was more settled. Um, and Lauren doesn't like cats, but she said to me very on, early on, like, yes, we can get a cat. Like, that would be, like, I'd get on with it. But now she's just trying to, like, bide her time with, like, dogs and engagements and stuff. <laughs> so, like, put me off the scent. <laughs> Every time Next like, will be another dog for the reason. Every time she does this, I'm like, just I haven't forgotten about the cat. Like we are getting a cat at some point. But, um, Is yeah. there any flaw that she's a cat person? <laughs> <laughs> Just in, in society in general, like when I grew up, being gay wasn't the cool thing and wasn't really like the most accepted thing in the world. And it was kind of, I never really, I never knew anybody that was a woman and gay, like, or uh, part of the community, I always saw gay men. And that for me, I just never had that representation really. I never really understood what life looked like as a queer person. I never understood that you could be all these different parts of like a spectrum of how you feel and who you are. And I think I was just a kid that was very confused about the fact that I wanted to be playing football with the boys, not kissing the boys, and didn't know how to like put that into the fact that I was gay. Like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't understand if that was being part of being gay and queer. And it just for me was, I knew I had all these bunch of like feelings about how I wanted to like even what clothes I wanted to wear and what made me feel confident, and that was always like more of like a masculine image, and that I actually like went the other way of then like having to conform into like to fit in with the rest of the kids at school and to like have friends and not be bullied because I was bullied as a young kid f for being gay, whatever that meant, even though I didn't know what it meant at the time. After a really long battle with like my mental health and anxiety, I sort of had figured out this, this thing of like, like I was living behind this line that it was causing me all this anxiety and I was like, to save myself and my own life, I need to come out and take this first step into coming out and just expressing who I am and, and saying to the world, look, this is who I am and you either take me and love me for that or you don't. And uh, maybe some people fall to the wayside. And, and that for me was a big risk because I didn't want to lose people. But I think at the point at which you then like accept yourself, it's way easier then to be at the point then when you can say that to other people. <laughs> she wants to get off. It is a nerve wracking thing to do. And I think everyone expects to like get faced with quite a lot of backlash for it and I think that's typically what's portrayed is that you will get backlash and I know a lot of people that did have a bad coming out story so it's not like it's untrue um and yeah in sport it wasn't it wasn't too bad for me I think you know I was 22 so I was a little bit older when I came out it took me a while to kind of figure out where what I kind of identified with um like it took me a while to kind of realize that I was bisexual and wasn't you know, gay or straight, it took me a while to get to that point. Um, and it was quite scary at first, like we had like male coaches at the time, nobody had really, I think they'd been like a couple of athletes before that had come out, but not really for a long time. Um, and we just kind of like started, I just kind of, was like me and all of my other teammates started coming out at the same sort of time. So we just started to like drip feed things in about like having girl crushes and things like eventually, and like, it just didn't really ever have to like officially come out to anybody because it was just kind of like, oh yeah, like, Jude dates girls as well, and it just kind of became a thing. I never had to officially do it. Fred again, I've got, I'm absolutely obsessed with him. I've got a tattoo of his lyrics. Um, but he um, has just released a new track called Adore You, and it's going to be a tune of the summer, I tell you. And she would follow him around the world. Like, yeah. What's the lyrics of the, the tattoo? Uh, I've got a tattoo on my chest that says, what comes next will be marvellous um, and I got that last year when I was like injured not in a very great place in my life um, and it's from a song of his called we lost Dan we've lost dancing um, and it's about he it's about like in the lockdown. the lockdown and like how we can be together and how like I guess it's like the the party scene and the rave scene like disappeared because we didn't 
when I able to like dance with each other and um, it's like part of the lyrics in the song and it talks about like if we live through the next six months and we make it for the next six months like what comes next will be marvellous and I think there's just something really beautiful about that because it's just like in any given situation in your life when you're going through a difficult period and a difficult time in your life like I always think to myself like if you can make it through the next six months what, like what comes next will be marvellous and it was kind of a little bit of like a uh, and owed to that in, in being like I'm in a bad place in my life right now and in six months time like I'm going to be in an incredible place in my life. This is the catalogue of what I, um, <laughs> so we're going to be starting an, uh, an Etsy business, um, <laughs> well Jude is, um, I, um, and this is going to be the catalogue of things that Jude will be selling. Um, this is what she made for our friend that has, uh, she made for Robin and Laurie's baby um, and little cardigan. Um, then she made another one for my friend Ben, who I train with. That was Ben and Megs. That was Ben and Megs, this one. Uh, for their baby Eva. Um, this was for Alba. Uh, for Laurie and Robin. <laughs> so she's making all sorts of baby clothes. This is Jude's crop top that she made. Um, that, that thing in there. Little, what would you call it? What is that? It's, it's, a, it's patchwork a, sort of thing. It's a, well, you can make it into a blanket, but I've just got to keep... Make she just it. makes it like huge. Yeah. Um, and then this is the vest that she made me. I've been um, like two days, my thumbs hurt. <laughs> yeah. It's, it like, and I just wear that like as a vest. So for us, it's not when we go to sport. It's not now like uh, the place where we're affected the most. Like, and it's not the thing that we talk about the most. But when we come home and we are talking to our friends that are from the community, or we're going out and we're meeting with them, or we're hearing about these things going on or we're reading online about like, or receiving even like hate from people online for who we are, that's where you feel it. And then it kind of, for me, makes me want to lean into it more and be more visible and talk about it more. And um, I guess it's identifying the ways for me of like, what's the most effective way to tackle this. And for me, it's like looking into not always tackling that in a very like outward facing way of like responding to every hateful comment but actually what is the like systemic ways we can change that for me it's like going behind the scenes how can we influence the people that actually can create culture change um, and within sport i think that for us like I, I look at like jude's team and stuff and they're really like blessed with actually like uh, quite a high population of career athletes mm. on their team and so for them it's just kind of like if anyone came out it would wouldn't even be anything for them whereas for me i've come from a sport where there are very very few of us it's like i can count on one hand how many athletes across the olympic and paralympic team we have uh, and i think that for us we still don't know where our place is like we celebrated our very first prides like event that we ran as athletes um oh yeah um like we celebrated our very first pride event this year and so we like still navigating how to be visible and like how to celebrate that and it not being something to be like ashamed of as well. This is like the sticker. This is the sticker that went on our boat from Rio. Um, so that like sits on the side of our boat. I mean, I need to get the one from my Tokyo boat, but like, I just keep, I love keeping stuff like this. I think it's just awesome, like looking back on stuff and like all the memories that these things hold for us. This is my Tokyo one. So these, are, these are actually the ones that I won my finals in. So like getting to like keep them and um, like, I want to be able to like put them up on the wall probably like one day. Our coaches did a really cool thing. They like, one day we had a meeting, we went back to our rooms and they'd like put boxes in our rooms and they had these shoes in. And they um, got like our names put on the side of them, um, and the other, got the other numbers got yeah, so like a flag on it. Like they bought them all, they like found this company that like got them all decaled up for us and like put our numbers on them. Where's the number gone? Hamer. They both say Hamer. I thought I had my number on as well, but I don't. Um, so that's really cool. And I only wore them in Tokyo, and I wouldn't wear them again because it was like for that event, so I just feel like a bit like bad juju to get to wear them again. And then yeah, this is the book that Lauren proposed in. So this is like the page that it was open on. It's like my favourite Harry Potter book and it's like she tied the ring to that ribbon there in the middle. Talk me through the proposal. So like she got down on one knee and like she had like she had the ring tied like to the ribbon in the middle and this is my favourite Harry Potter book and the chapter's called The Unbreakable Vow. Um and yeah she just like had it tied to that and just asked me 
to marry her. Although both of us afterwards couldn't remember if she actually did ask me to marry her or if I said yes because we were both a bit like, after it happened, so lucky they did record it because neither of us knew what we said, so lucky we've got it to look back on. We, Jude and I very much are like alternative, we like to go against the grain of what's been done in just having a queer wedding in itself and, and being in a queer relationship, it's against the norm and we definitely want to do things that, you know, we want people to come to our wedding and go like, I've never been to a wedding like this before and do things that are very true to us and our relationship and um, is not conventional, like societal, like traditional wedding. Yeah. Uh, and the roles that like, I guess like a man and a woman would play in that relationship because we are two women. So I think there's so many things that we're like finding out and like, we hear Pete from other queer like couples or we've like seen um, through different people and we definitely want it to be like a very different wedding to what people are very much used to and do it very true to who we are. <laughs> Make me cry again. Mm-hmm. <laughs>